And they're standing up, waiting to see if Maris is going to hit number 61. Here's the windup. Fastball hit deep to right. This could be it. Way back there. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Hum Baby Baseball channel. And today it's time to get back into Ken Burns baseball. We were working on this series in lieu of a season because it looked like we weren't going to have a season, but then the season started. So we took a little break. It's time to come back and finish up the series. We're in the 60s now, and we're going to be talking about a lot of crazy stuff and a lot of great baseball during the 60s. And we're going to go ahead and jump over to Ball Caps, where he's going to give us the whole recap, and then we'll get into it. So go ahead. Thank you, Eric. It's great to be back and, and doing this again. And now that the season's over, it's kind of a nice time to dig back into you know the history of baseball. So let's go. Inning eight, like you said, focusing on the 60s, titled A Whole New Ball Game. We start with the 1960 World Series between the Yankees and Pirates and find one of the most iconic home runs ever hit. Bottom of the ninth, the game tied at nine. Ralph Terry on the mound for the Yankees. Bill Mazeroski steps to the plate and hit the first walk-off home run in a World Series. We wouldn't see another one until 1993. Then in 1961, the home run would dominate the headlines again when Babe Ruth's record of 60 homers seemed to be within reach of two current Yankees, Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris. Expansion had thinned the pitching staffs, and the number of games had been increased to 162, so Babe's 60 was in reach. Mantle started out hotter. By the time he had 10, Maris had four. But by the midsummer, Maris had gone supernova and belted 74 homers in 38 games. Now, the pressure of catching the babe was intense. Fans, writers, and even the front office wanted Mantle to break the record. Maris wasn't Ruth. He wasn't a lifelong Yankee. He wasn't as comfortable in the spotlight. Mantle, on the other hand, was Ruthian in many ways and was beloved by Yankee fans. Now, injuries forced Mantle out of the race early with 54 home runs, and Maris hit number 61 in game 162, which led to Commissioner Ford Frick attaching an asterisk. But Maris had done it eight more games than Ruth. After the 61 season, Frick ordered the strike zone widened, which brought about pitching dominance. We meet Sandy Koufax, Bob Gibson, Tom Seaver, and Jim Palmer. Koufax from 61 to 66 won three Cy Youngs, five ERA titles, threw four no-hitters, all through excruciating pain. Heat before games, ice after, and cortisone shots every other day. Ultimately, he would retire at the age of 31 because of the pain. Gibson was incredible. Two-time Cy Young Award winner, nine-time All-Star, nine-time Gold Glove winner. Perhaps the best way to convey his dominance? He won seven straight World Series starts all complete games. Jim Palmer had his own incredible streak. Eight 20 win seasons over a nine year stretch. Think about that for a minute. Additionally, we're introduced to Carl Yastrzemski, an 18 time All Star, won the Triple Crown and smacked 3,419 hits, 452 which were home runs. We also meet Brooks Robinson, maybe the best fielding third baseman of all time, an 18 time All Star, and a 16 time Gold Glove winner. The 60s wind down with the Miracle Mets. In the cellar the season before, they turn it around in 1969 in a big way, winning 100 games behind the pitching of Jerry Kuzman, Tom Seaver, and a young Nolan Ryan. The offense was led by center fielder Tommy Agee. The Mets would meet the Orioles in the World Series that year. The O's took game one, but the Mets took the next four to win the series and the Miracle Mets moniker. The 60s also saw further expansion west, the LA Angels and the Colt 45s, and the Senators moved from D.C. to Minnesota. A lot happening in this inning, some expansion. There was also some off-the-field uh, off the field strife in the country. You had unrest here in the U.S. Martin Luther King was assassinated. 
you had Vietnam happening, you had the popularity of football. So baseball ends the 60s with a little bit of strife happening. And that's going to be our inning eight recap. Eric, take me back. What do you think? What do you like? What kind of stands out for you the most from the 60s? Is it is it the Mazeroski homer? Is it the home run race? Is it the pitching? What do you like the most out of the out of the 60s and out of this episode? Yeah, to me, what stands out is 1961, the, the home run race. I would, uh, uh, I mean, I, I lost the movie. If you, I'm sure you've seen the movie, uh, the Billy Crystal movie. But even before then, I mean, I absolutely was just uh, fascinated with that home run race with uh, two guys. I mean, it's amazing. It's a, it's rare enough for one guy to mm-hmm. actually chase that single season record, but two guys on the same team, and um, the whole storyline that I'm sure we're going to get into with um, Maris, who's you know, not so much of a, a classic Yankee type where you got Mantle, who is the classic Yankee and everyone loves him. And, you know, at mm-hmm. the end of the day, it's it's Maris who who ends up doing it. I thought it was just a great. So it's like a, and they made a movie out of it because it, it is like a movie storyline. It's like almost unbelievable, but it actually happens. So that's what I think of when I think of the 60s. That's what stands out most. Yeah, that Billy Crystal movie to anybody who haven't hasn't seen 61. Go Go watch that right now. Like when you're done watching this, put that <laughs> on. It is a really great recounting. He's a great baseball fan. He really did his research. There's a lot of good. Um, it, it's almost like a documentary. It, it, it's so well done. And you bring up a good point. Uh, having two guys that are making a run. In fact, they were on the same team is extra motivating. But it almost seems like for somebody to make a run at a home run record, there has to be somebody pushing them. Think about you got you, you got Mantle and Maris. You had um, you had McGuire and Sosa, right? They were pushing each other, and yep. then Bonds, Bonds, when he was going for it, I think Bonds was just chasing ghosts, right? Like he wanted to pass uh, Babe Ruth. He want he like where he wanted to go. He was driven not by the guy next to him, but by the guys that you know were, were preceded him, and that yeah. was his driving force. You have to have some kind of driving force because if you're just out there on your own. You know, let's say you're at 60 home runs with a week to go, and the next closest guy is at like 40. You just don't maybe have the same drive. I don't. I don't know. What What do you think? Wait, let's Let's talk about that real quick. You know, with the home run record, um, your, your guy did it, Barry Bonds, 73. There's the clouds of you know of the steroid era. Give me your thoughts on that. What are your What are your thoughts on Bonds and the home run record yeah. and all that? I'm really curious to hear. Well, first thing I I did want to say when you said he was chasing, yeah, he's definitely was chasing um, the ghost of the past and uh, McGuire because I think when he saw McGuire hitting those seventy home runs and McGuire getting all the attention and Sosa getting all the attention, he's there thinking, dude, I'm 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 ten times as good as these dudes. These yep. guys are garbage compared to me. Yep. He knew what they were up to, so then he did it, and then he goes off and uh, becomes an absolute machine and hits seventy three home runs like it's a video game. And right. I think he wanted to prove it, and he—I think he did prove it. He's definitely uh, the better, the better player uh, compared to those guys. No disrespect, obviously, McGuire, Sosa are great, but, um, but no. As far as the record, I wish none of them broke the record. I wish it was still in the hands of Roger Maris, and I wish it was still um, the career record was still with Aaron because those guys, you know, I, I don't like the clouds. I don't like the fact that they needed to take some kind of a, you know, a drug to enhance their their bodies and able to do it. So, and and and, and it's just going to be a questionable. Um, record going to have a cloud over it and I'm a huge Barry Bonds fan and I wish I could be proud of the record and say hey my guy's got the record but then if I ever say that you know that's not going to fly because everyone knows why he was able to do it so no I'm as I'm as much as a fan I as I am I wish that he never took steroids I wish none of those guys did and and I wish none of them broke the record unless they were able to do it cleanly do you think if somebody passes 61 if somebody gets to 62 is it going to is it going to matter yeah, I think it's going to be a big deal. I think it would be. I think uh, right now, you know, we love storylines. Uh, MLB Network would be talking about it. Everyone would be talking about it. 50, 50 51, 52, as, as it gets closer, how many does he have to hit? Uh, it would be a big, because we know they're not going to reach 73, because 73 right. is out of reach. But 60 or 61, 62, that's could be in reach. And if somebody like, I don't know who, Trout or, um, you know, that uh, the New York Mets, I forgot Alonzo? his name. Or, yeah. Pete, so, Pete Alonzo? Yeah, Pete Alonso. If one of those guys mm-hmm. were to hit, um, you know, be on the on on track, I think it would be a huge story. Yeah, I was looking at some names and trying to think of okay, who could do it? 
you know, the, there's Pete Alonso, right? Yeah. The, 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 the similarities to McGuire are striking. You know, the home runs in his rookie season, the, the playing the first base, just the body type, the build, kind of all very similar to Mark McGuire. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, does Bellinger have a shot if he goes crazy? Oh, and and there's, you know, there's guys on that team that, you know, they could get into a home run derby. You know, Bellinger and Betts could get into a home run derby, and that could, you know, launch Bellinger into the stratosphere. Yeah. Um, you know, could Trout do it? You know, his his home run per fly ball ratio has been going up. Uh, Arenado, maybe out there in Colorado. Yeah, I, I, I don't. There's not a lot of names. Um, is what I'm getting at. Like, there are some guys, but they're like maybe they're. I mean, you know, I also I think um, I actually think that Eloy Jimenez with the White Sox, maybe he's a guy because again, be, yeah. he could get into a, a home run derby kind of situation with Luis Robert or Jose Abreu. Or, or somebody like that. There's, there's got to be a driving force. Maybe Aaron Judge, you know, maybe somebody like that. And I'm wondering. I mean, do you have Judge, a? Yeah. If you were to have to, if you were to have to place a bet on somebody to get to 62, of those names I gave you, who who would you be most comfortable putting money down on getting to 62 mm -hmm. at some point in their career? Well, Pete Alonso came to mind because he hit 50 plus in his rookie year. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking if he, you know, um, either he's going to, you know, start getting worse um, because pitchers figure him out or he's just that good and, and he can continue to improve. So Pete Alonso and also Bellinger with that, that swing of his is so violent and he just crushes the ball. Yeah. And he could just um, figure a way to just, you know, and he's not that he's not consistent. I mean, he's awesome, but I'm just saying if he could figure a way just to, to, to even be a little more consistent as far as making that, that hard contact, I could see Bellinger too easily hitting 50 plus, maybe 60 home runs. Yeah, I and mean, the home run is, is is fascinating to just kind of think about. There were some other numbers in this one that really just blew my mind. The Gibson seven straight World Series complete game wins. Think about that. Palmer's eight 20 win seasons over nine years. Brooks Robinson, 16 time gold glove winner. I mean, it's incredible. It 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 almost feels like you get somebody right now who gets hot for a couple of years and then kind of tails off and just settles into you know, a, a nice, a nice career, yeah. but not like an all time career. Like we've got trout and pool holes are really the only two that have sort of reached that hall of fame level and sustained it. Now pool holes is on the downside of that, but it's just that kind of, you know, seeing those numbers, you know, and the fact that this is the sixties, you had, you had Gibson, you had Palmer, you had Koufax, you had Brooks Robinson, you Stramsky, Frank Robinson. You had so many guys, and um, I, you know, I feel like baseball is just getting back to that point, right? Like with guys like Bellinger and Trout and Alonzo, um, and and some of these younger guys that maybe turn into something big, like Robert um, and Kyle Lewis. I feel like we're just getting back to that point where we'll have a couple of guys that are like we know we're watching Hall of Famers. They've got ten years left in their career, but we know they're Hall of Famers right now. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned Luis Robert. There's there's several of them that are up and coming right now. Yeah, they, they just feel like they're going to be good for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. But in the 60s, it was a lot of uh, the pitch. That was the decade of pitching. And yeah, I don't know if we're going to ever see anything like that as far as the pitch years go. Even though now pitching is kind of better than it's ever been as far as the velocity and stuff. And they're just nasty. But still, even with that, the way that, you know, pitch count and everything, we're not going to see anybody pitch <laughs> complete games like that again. No, no, definitely not. It's just it's just too much wear and tear. And I think, you know, everyone's done too much research or, or there's too much science behind it to the point where yeah. they're like, no, you, you know, 75 pitches, 80 pitches, 95 pitches. You got to get them out. And we're all looking at numbers. We just saw it with Blake Snell in the World Series. Oh, pitch, pitch 75 is his kryptonite. Get him out of there before 75. In the World what, Series. Right. And, and he's he yanked. Got six months to rest. He gets yanked because – at pitch 75 and up, the opposing batting average goes to 300. It go it went from like 220 to 300 once he reaches pitch 75. So he's done. So it's not even necessarily about, oh, the guy's going to throw his arm out. It's that by the third time he's going through the lineup, they're crushing him. And that's kind of interesting that we, we don't have that kind of dominance where – didn't matter. You know, you see Koufax, you see Nolan Ryan, you see Bob Gibson for the third or the fourth time. Doesn't matter. You're not catching them. You're not hitting yeah. them. It's it, it, it's just you're right about that. And and I mean, even Shane Bieber, uh, you know, falls victim to that. Once you get to the third time, it's just it's just easier for the for the hitters.
Uh, it's yeah. it's sort of fascinating. Him, even if he's looking good on that particular day, which he was, even if it looks like he's dominating the second time through, uh huh, they still pull him. It, no, it, it's true. Um, in this uh, in this you know inning eight, we also had uh, just to kind of tie up maybe some loose ends, some other notes here. You know, we had a brief introduction to Pete Rose in this one. We'll obviously hear more about him in inning nine, and we hear about where he gets his. Nicknamed Charlie Hustle, uh, you know, for anybody who hasn't seen it or doesn't remember, he's out in spring training, uh, going up against the Yankees. Uh, you know, Mantle hits a it's a deep fly. I think it might have been Mantle or it was another Yankee hits a hits a home run, no doubt home run. And, and Pete, Pete Pete Rose is out there uh, climbing the wall trying to catch it. His spring training game, a no doubt home run, and they called him. You know, do you see Charlie Hustle out there in right field? Uh, so that's where he gets his nickname, and that stuck. We had the introduction to Frank Robinson. You know, 14-time All-Star, two-time MVP, won a Triple Crown his first year in Baltimore. Stan Musial, we finally had to mention to Stan Musial. He played in the 40s, 50s, and he retired in the early 60s. They finally bring him up. So any Cardinal fan that's waiting around, uh, you know, in inning seven and inning six, saying, where's my guy? Where's Stan the man? They finally bring him up uh, as he retired in, uh, in 1963 with the second most hits of all time, by the way. You know, wow. is, is Stan Musial sort of lost in time? Because 24-time All-Star, again, 3,630 hits. That was the second most. He was behind Ty Cobb with, with hits. One of the, you know, certainly one, one of the all-time greatest. Um, but sadly, I mean, what do you think? Do you, when you think about all-time greats, does Stan Musial come to mind? I say no, and, and I apologize to any Cardinal fans. I I don't, but maybe he should. I, I think I might be. He doesn't come. Something. Yeah, it doesn't come immediately to mind. It's probably that when you start running out of your top 10, 15, then I'll think of him. But yeah, no, he is not like one I you think of right off the bat. Yeah, um, it's true. It's it's sort of uh and he probably should. <laughs> yeah, he really should. There's some guy, there's some guys that just kind of slip. Um, and the fact that usually he was still playing in 1963, it's not like he was a guy who retired in you know 1925 or anything like that. Um it's been 60 years, but but yeah. still, you know, it's not like it was. It's been 100 years. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, you know, because when I watch these, I like to think about current players, and I was thinking that you know they're talking about Koufax. He's a big part of this one. You know, Koufax had a dominating stretch, and you know I'm on the Clayton Kershaw bandwagon. And anybody who watched any of my World Series videos, I was riding Clayton Kershaw throughout the playoffs. I was was strong on him this year. He came through. But the Koufax peak was from 62 to 66. He won three Cy Youngs and an MVP, had a 1.95 ERA and a 9.4 K rate. Kershaw's peak actually lasted two years longer from 2011 to 2017. ERA is a little higher, 2.1, but he had a higher K rate, 10.1, and also won three Cy Youngs and one MVP. So, why why are we not just 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 in in awe of what Clayton Kershaw has done? Is it what do you think? Is it the playoffs prior to this year? Is was, yeah. it, was it just a stain from the playoffs? It has to be because you know regular season they're 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 you know right there. Um, you know Koufax, I think he has three Cy Youngs and uh, uh Kershaw has yep he's got three himself. I think I'm not even sure, yep. but they're, they both yeah both both have three Cy Youngs and both yeah, have both one have MVP. Three. So. Yeah, they're there in the Cy Youngs, they're there at ERA, they're there in the uh, wins and losses, and they're there um, for everything. So I think that Kershaw, yeah, he's just had some terrible outings, um, especially in some some elimination games over the years. But he's had some great outings too, and he's looked fantastic many times. So yeah. I think that just those little bad outings that stand out, and he's kind of got the reputation as a, a poor postseason pitcher, even though he's not that bad. But right. when you look at his his overall, you know, postseason uh, career, yeah, it's not up to his, his regular standard when you look at it just uh, full you know, ERA and everything. But I still think, yeah, I mean, come on, you can't just – can't say he's – you know, he's not great because of, of some bad outings. I mean, overall, I think, yeah, they're very close. Yeah. One other point I wanted to note about Koufax because there's some guys, and there's one in particular that comes to mind. He's not a pitcher. He's a hitter. But when we look at – for Hall of Fame qualifications, when we look at who's a Hall of Famer, we want somebody who sort of – was great for a decade, right? Like that's kind of the thing. It's like either you know, be either be great over a decade or great over your career. 
Why is Koufax on the pitching Mount Rushmore? And now some people might watch this and they're like, he's not on my Mount Rushmore, but he's considered one of the best. He did it for five seasons. The, the first half of his career was not good. Yeah. Why, do, why does Andrew Jones not get into the Hall of Fame? <laughs> Jones yep. from 98 to 07 yeah. was the best center fielder in baseball. Age 21 to 29, he won 10 gold gloves. Uh, you know, was a prodigious home run hitter, was the was the meat of that Braves lineup that was going to the playoffs every year. So maybe there's no answer to this, but why is Koufax a god for five seasons? I don't know. And Andrew Jones can't sniff the Hall of Fame after 10 years of being incredible. You can mention Roger Maris, too. He got, he got an MVP in 60, broke the record in 61. He you know, won a World Series with the Cardinals. and yeah, he, geez, But he's not in because such a short, you know, only four or five years. So, yeah, Andrew Jones, too. I don't know. Uh, I guess I know Koufax was ridiculous. I mean, but, yeah. but you know, so was so was Maris. So was, uh, so was Jones. So that's a really good question. But uh, – uh, he just he just got a reputation as just an unbelievable pitcher, you know, in that in the yeah. early um, to mid '60s, and was just pretty much unhittable, um, yeah. throwing all the shit. I don't know about 50 shutouts or something of that like that. And the guy was yeah, just ridiculous. Was, he was dominant. And, uh, he was dominant for sure. He, he I mean, it was uh, the the run that he went on, you know, for pitchers is greater than the run that Andrew Jones went on for center fielders. But you know, um, I, don't I think know. Andrew I, Jones should be in the Hall of Fame if I'm not mistaken. I think I. I think I uh, I had him as uh, I guess someone who should get in. He definitely should. Um, one more uh, point, sort of off the field. Be remiss if we didn't bring up Marvin Miller in this one. We get introduced to Marvin Miller here. This man brings us the MLBPA, and whether you hate how the owners and players sort of uh, you know deal with each other, and and how you know it ultimately leads to strikes and lockouts, and you know delayed starts of seasons during pandemics. Um, you know, he <laughs> gave the he gave the players a rights. He gave them power with the MLBPA, the, the unionization. Because prior to that, players had no right, no leverage. They were not represented at the table. Owners did whatever they want. Um, so Marvin Miller was a very important part, played a very important role in the history of baseball, and he is brought up and mentioned in this one. Let's get to the historic teams. So we have three here: uh, the Yankees. They go to five straight World Series from 60 to 64, and they win two of them. The Dodgers go to three World Series, and they win two, uh, 63 and 65. The Cardinals go to three World Series, and they win two as well, 64 and 67. So we have three all-time historic teams come out of this decade. Let me get to our time machine. Now, You know, people may be checking this out for the first time. Uh, if you are checking it out for the first time, make sure you go back and watch our, our previous uh, innings, the, the even innings are on Eric's channel. The odd innings are on my channel. One of the uh, segments we have is the time machine. What would you want to go back to to witness firsthand? You only get one item. The nominees that I had, you may have uh, others, but Mazeroski's walk-off home run in Game 7, the home run chase in 61, Koufax, Gibson, what would you – so what's your time machine moment out of out of the 60s? What would you want to go back to and witness firsthand? Yeah. Uh, well, I'd say if Joe Carter never hit that home run, probably would go back to Mazeroski because I just would love to be – I mean, though I wasn't there in Toronto, but, you know, I was watching live and yep. got to see, you know, a, a game-winning home run to win, to win the World Series. And so since I've seen that uh, firsthand sort of, you know, um, live – I will instead pick 61 and just to witness to be part of that chase uh, would just be, and even though we got something similar with McGuire and Sosa, um, but I think that it just it had to be so special here with uh, Maris and obviously with Mantle. I mean, Mickey Mantle is one of the greatest. I mean, these are two guys, just unbelievable chase right there and would have loved to have seen that firsthand. Uh, I agree with you. We are, we are in lockstep with this one. It'd be the home run chase. You know, the home run is, is, yeah, outside of a no hitter or a perfect game, uh, the home run is the most exciting thing we have in baseball. And to to be there for that chase um, would be would be something special. And 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 I think we would have to go back in the time machine because if we were there in real time, we might have a different opinion of it because of how <laughs> beloved Babe Ruth was. So we would definitely have to be going back with our current knowledge. Yes, from 2020 to 1961. Because if we were in yeah. 1961. We probably would be, you know, hating on Roger Maris 
uh, <laughs> at that point too. So that's, yeah, that's, that's important to know. Let's talk about the do over. So the do over is what from this decade, would you maybe want to see happen differently? If you could change one thing and make it something better, what would it be? Would it be Maris's treatment? Uh, would it be, the Reds trading Frank Robinson. Um, yeah. thinking he was he was too old to to play. Would it be you know uh, maybe Marvin Miller not having Marvin Miller? Maybe maybe having a different route for the players to to get a representation. What would what do you think? What is your uh, do over moment maybe from this one? Well, uh, Roger Maris he did break the record, but it was it was just wrong. That that was a rough, rough thing for uh, that he went through. And like you mentioned earlier, if you if you don't know about it, watch sixty one. The film it, it really portrays it really well. But yeah, just uh, uh, terrible with the media and everything that Maris went through. Definitely think that uh, he should have gotten treated a lot better, and it might have uh, affected him the rest of his career. And because you know he won an MVP in sixty, mm -hmm. and you know he does this in sixty one, and kind of started to fizzle out a little bit. And you know he, he he died relatively young, so I don't know how much it affected him, but uh, that was a rough year for Maris. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, you know that's that's right up there. I, I'm going to go with the Reds trading Frank Robinson. Um, you know, trading him at the age of 30, thinking he's too old. He goes out, he wins an MVP uh, with the Orioles, gets the gets the triple crown with the Orioles. Basically, it would be the equivalent of in in two years. Um, you know, the, the angels, uh, deciding to move on from Mike Trout. Now I know Mike Trout is on a higher trajectory than Frank Robinson, but you know, it's, it, it an all time great player being dealt away. Um, yeah. it would just be to, to take your best player, trade him away. I can only imagine reds, the heartache reds fans had to deal with for the several years after that. Cause Frank Robinson went on and had many years of greatness, uh, with the Orioles and helped them win a world series. So I'm going to go, you know, uh, on the field with uh, the Reds trading away Frank Robinson. I think huge mistake for that for that franchise. And let's get to the last one. Socially speaking, uh, this is sort of a fun one. Thinking about if they had social media at the time, uh -huh. who would be the most interesting follow? Whether it be Instagram or Twitter or you know Facebook, uh, who would you be most interested? in following or who do you think would be the best follow some of the nominees i had you know you someone else may come to mind for you but casey stengel uh yogi Berra, you know very eccentric i know at the time they were older but you know donald trump's old and he's a very interesting follow whether it would no matter what side of the spectrum you land on he's a very interesting follow um and you know they were older at the time mickey mantle you know all of the off the field you got to think he probably would have loved soaking up some social media spotlight Bob Gibson, I could see Bob Gibson talking a lot of trash on social media. Marvin Miller, maybe uh, giving some behind the scenes to the player rights. Don Drysdale, uh, one of the things mentioned in this in this inning is how Don Drysdale and Sandy Koufax sort of uh, almost went on strike uh, or threatened to not play because they <laughs> demanded a better salary. Uh, Sandy Koufax was such a gentleman, I don't think he would have said a word. But Don Drysdale, I feel like he might have spoken up and you, there could have been an interesting follow there on social media. So if you're picking, uh, you know, who who do you think might have been the most interesting to follow on social media back then? That's a lot of good ones. Uh, you know, I think the, the obvious choice that jumped in my mind was Yogi Berra, just because we know all about his expressions and his crazy... Yeah. Uh, Thing that he comes up with who knows what he'd come up with on twitter i mean they say that he just does that naturally so who knows what kind of gold we'd get on we got enough gold uh, as it is you know nickel ain't worth a dime anymore it ain't yeah. over till it's over <laughs> all this stuff you know no one goes to that restaurant anymore it's too crowded uh mm -hmm. so he's got so much gold uh, i would love to see what he comes up with on twitter yeah. or whatever yeah i think you're right on there that's that is a good one um you know, Casey Stengel, sort of the same same thing. You know, what, what they had, they, they had, they were Stengelese. Yeah, um, Stengelese, yeah. You know, there, there comes a time in every man's life, and I've had many of them. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the trick is growing up without growing old. You know, they, those guys, I think, would have been just gold to follow on, on social media. So, you know, it might have been, you know, some scandalous stuff to follow like a Mickey Mantle. But uh, I think you're right with, with either – uh, Stengel yeah, or, or Barra there. Yogi Berry is on the Yankees, so he's going to have that inside info. Maybe he'll share some some, yeah. some juicy stuff too. So yeah, yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's that, that. Those are good. Those are good ones. I, I like that. I like the idea of of uh, Stengel or or Barra out of that one. Um, 
that's all I had from this one. Those are all my notes. Do you have, uh, Eric, do you have anything else that you want to add in? No, that's about, I thought you were going to ask about the, uh, you know, we usually talk about somebody who stood out. I thought Billy Crystal oh, yeah, yeah. did a, a really great job. Yes. I just wanted to give him a shout out because I love how he was saying, talking about how, you know, what happened to the, you know, when they moved, which I'm happy about, obviously as a Giants fan, but you know, the move from New York to San Francisco was such a, a change. And all of a sudden there's no, it's not downtown anymore. There's no trolleys. There's no, the community It's totally different. And I could see that. And I thought he expressed it really well. Yeah, you're right. But Billy Crystal was a, was a good one in this one. Doris Kearns good one uh, was good in this one too. Talking about you know going to the Red Sox, uh, you know after she had lost her the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, t- to out west and and her fandom didn't follow. Uh, she yeah. started to started to root for for the Red Sox. Uh, there were a few there were a few good ones. Crystal was a good one too. Yeah. So yeah, that about does it. So appreciate everybody joining us today. We're talking about the '60s inning number eight, and we'll be back for inning number nine. That'll be over on Ball Cap Sports. So make sure to jump over there. Just hit 3,000, if I'm not mistaken. So mm-hmm. go subscribe over there if you're not already subscribed. I don't know what you're doing. So go subscribe to Ball Cap Sports. So really appreciate it. And uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you so much. we we'll talk to you next time. See ya. Sorry. <laughs>